So I'm just warning you in advance because if sometime during the program we all go, oh my gosh, and we have to run inside, then we'll just kind of take a little break or we'll, we'll move you over to another uh, segment and then we'll do that. So just remember, uh, we are here, we are in Flagstaff, we're outside, we're live, and we've got a really, really great program for you tonight. We're going to find out, we'll have some polling questions for the audience. We're going to find out if you've been here before, and if you haven't, we're going to make it so enticing that you want to come up here yourself, make this journey, and come visit this amazing place. Uh, one, of, uh, one of the points of pride for Arizona, to be sure. So uh, just in a way of introductions, I always forget to do this, but I am Rick Alling, and I am a manager of outreach programs for the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University. And... Uh, in our role with my team here, uh, this is what we do. We try to take the research that's going on, the activities that are happening, uh, current programs and current projects. We try to sort of make it accessible to a bigger public. And we've been doing this for about a little over two years now. This was a COVID idea. And now we're going to just stick with it and do it forever. So well, ever? Should I say ever? Uh, Kim is saying, yep, let's do ever. So, uh, so we're, we're going to keep doing this. So every other Wednesday night. This also is a special version because we're actually, uh, we've expanded. We're actually, we couldn't fit everything into one hour. So I hope it's okay with you. We're going to actually do 90 minutes tonight. And so if you have to drop out, sorry about that. But yes, uh, there's a lot going on here. Uh, I have actually a really special guest. You guys have seen her before. She wasn't going to let us kind of get up into the mountains without, uh, let me see what we get up here. So go on. Oh, there you go. I think people have seen Luna before. She's like going, what's going on? She, she doesn't want to. Yeah, come over on this side. So I think you guys have seen Luna before. This is my trick uh, to make Luna kind of come onto camera. Do you think it's going to work? I think it is, yes. So uh, anyway, Luna loves the mountains. Luna is a really good traveling dog, and so she's come up here to sort of like stay with us. And we'll sort of see if she'll come on a little later and be a little calmer. Thank you, Luna. Good dog. Don't forget your lovely <laughs> wife, Jackie. So she's uh, she, she's pretty excited about the trip and traveling with other people. Uh, so um, uh, up here is part of the team, and I'm going to introduce you uh, to uh, who's here, and you've met some of these people before. And then also uh, uh, back at campus, uh, we still have uh, one of our staff members is is there kind of heading up and, and, and manning the home base. So, uh, oh yeah, so and I'm getting a, a message to keep looking into the camera here. So uh, this is a new format for us. So, uh, so up here joining us are two students. You've met Alex Blanche before, and he's the one at the camera. He's trying to kind of keep convince me to keep looking over in his direction. Uh, so uh, Alex is here, and he'll be sort of manning that and helping us with the tech. Uh, Arma, Arman, you've met Arman, and uh, he is off this area right now, but Arman and Alicia are here, and what they're going to be doing is we're going to kind of like join in with them. They're going to be uh, finding places at Lowell Observatory where we can just interact with them. They'll tell us when they have a place, when they're in something interesting, and we'll just kind of clip over to them and ask them what they're doing, and they're going to sort of find some places around to kind of share with us during the hour and a half program, so that'll be kind of fun. Uh, Kim Baptista is here. She's running the web. She's right across from me. We were just noticing that uh, we actually never uh, actually do it this way. We're always in different places and different rooms. And so now we're actually broadcasting and we're actually in the same uh, same environment. So, so that's really cool. So I'm glad Kim is here. Uh, and then uh, I guess if you guys are Enterprise fans, you've watched Star Trek. Remember, you can't send everybody down to the planet because somebody has to remain on the Enterprise to beam us back again. And uh, I guess it was always Scotty in Enterprise, but Meg is taking on that role here. So she's back at the home office and she's helping us monitor uh, the questions and, the, and those kinds of things. Remember, we do a webinar format so chat doesn't work. Uh, we do encourage you to communicate with us, but use the question and answer button. It's on your screen. You see it on the bottom of the screen. If you have, and as we're going, I'm going to have some guests, and I'm going to want you to sort of like participate and ask some questions of us as we go along. We will take a couple of breaks during the program, kind of go back and pull some audience questions uh, from you uh, uh, up here to Lowell so we can answer those. And so that'll be really, really super cool. Uh, and that's a, kind of our normal format. We also run closed captioning. I think uh, we always like to announce this. It's up to you to use it or not. I don't know if you know this, but you can turn it on or off your own screen. So you can do that. And then we always advise people to sort of make your, your, the, your Zoom full screen and uh, so you can see everything. We'll have some slides, we'll have some videos, and we'll have some other things going. So, so do it that way. 
And I think that's all we have to sort of talk about in the way of housekeeping. And I think just to keep on track, I'm going to start to introduce my first guest. Uh, we're going to have two guests this evening, uh, both of them from the Flagstaff area. And, uh, and uh, one of them uh, here joining me now, this is a, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine. We do board service together for an organization, and I've known Brian for about four or five years. Uh, Brian Bates is uh, uh, actually and also a resident of Flagstaff for many years. Brian, you might know him if you're sort of uh, familiar with the Flagstaff area, is that he was a candidate for county supervisor last year. He's been an educator at Coconino Community College for many, many years, now retired for that and he's involved in all kinds of different things and it all relates to what we're talking about today so i'm going to sort of have uh, brian come on and sort of introduce yourself more than i just introduced you and uh and then we'll kind of start a little conversation we've got quite a little uh, we have an array of talk of to topics we're going to try to do today well thank you, thank you rick it's a real pleasure to be here with you at lowell observatory this is a historic place of course absolutely uh, lowell came out here in the 1800s or early 1900s i think it was and was looking for somewhere to uh, create a uh, an observatory uh, and chose flagstaff because of its clear skies this is the <laughs> international dark sky city now it's dark tonight because of the clouds but the point behind it is that we actually were the first ones to have light ordinances here. That's right. And I was fortunate to work with uh, some of the people that were the original committee working on this. There are a lot of them that I won't go into names, but. Uh, Brian, you should know that we've actually covered the dark sky, the international dark sky yeah. um, you know, program. And uh, we've actually shared information and had visitors from Fountain Hills, which is one of the last, the, the latest uh -huh. members of the international dark sky community. But yes, right, Flagstaff was the first, and probably and, was the first. And, uh, yeah. decidedly because this observatory was here, and Flagstaff was growing, and right, is that the is the, that the story? That's uh, that's a major part of it. Okay. Uh, so Lowell Observatory was very much involved. So was uh, Chris Luganbuehl, who worked at the uh, Naval Observatory, okay. and so the Naval Observatory was one that was pushing it quite a bit, also. But it was a combination of Lowell, the Naval Observatory, and a community of people who were really concerned about making sure that we have dark skies. And it is now, I was on the uh, uh, planning committee for Doney Park, where I live, mm -hmm. and we made it part of our stipulations that we will remain a dark skies community, even out in the country. That's so uh, lighting codes will be enforced out there as well. I think more and more people and more and more places are aware of the resource of the night sky and we're only going to keep it if we sort of have these controls over our lighting and um, and and there's nothing going to stop us from growing we just have to grow smarter and we have to grow by by adding light that's that's compatible to a dark sky that's exactly what we're trying to do here i didn't mean to divert that but you brought it up and it's an important part of lowell and the history of flagstaff so, it's a, well it's an important part of being able to see the sky and to begin to understand not only what we study, the cultural astronomy of Native Americans, uh, but also our history with, uh, with the, hot, the sky. And, you know, I, we, I take folks on backpack trips, on river trips, all over, over across the Southwest. I'm, and, I'm envious. I hear about this all the time because <laughs> uh, I'm still working out, obviously. I haven't retired yet. I'm still sort of thing. And... And uh, Brian, I'm aware, sort of retired about, what, four years ago now or more? Yeah, about six four years. years ago. And he's been running people down the Grand Canyon. He's been doing all these trips. He's sort of like taking people everywhere. And um, I'm envious. So good for you. Hey, I, I wanted to just talk a little bit more broadly about the state of Arizona. Mm -hmm. And when Brian and I were talking about a little bit ago, sort of kind of warming up for this thing, um, we, we can definitely call Arizona an astronomy state and in no two doubt. different ways right so one way is there's all these observatories we'll talk about some of the others and the science that goes on here the research that goes on here we never miss a chance to tell you what we're doing at arizona state university but that's actually those kinds of research projects are happening at all three universities and there's observatories everywhere and there's a chance for people to sort of tour these facilities so that's one arizona astronomy state the other one that we'll get to next, we're going to do these in two parts. The second one we want to talk about is cultural astronomy. Uh, astronomy in Arizona has been important 
for thousands of years, not just since technology happened, not just since Percival Lowell decided to plop this observatory on top of Mars Hill. It's been going on here forever. And, and, and uh, Brian and I share a passion for that, and, some, some, and we do some work together in that area. So first, let's talk about sort of Arizona as an astronomy state by virtue of its uh, observatories. And you do take tours around. What kinds of things do you go see? How do people get into those places? Well, I work for a number of different companies, and uh, yeah, we'll come here to Lowell. Uh, have, uh, I brought uh, several tours here, because this is a fascinating place. It has an incredible history. Uh, a lot of folks associate this, of course, with Pluto, which is yeah. very, very true. The other thing that's interesting is that we all know of the Doppler shift, the red shift. Yeah. That was actually first uh, discovered here. Huh? I didn't know. Uh, an astronomer named Slifer was working here and he noticed that there was this slight shift and it appeared that the planets were, uh, not the planets, that stars were moving away. And uh, he published that, but it wasn't really uh, brought up until Hubble, of course, came back and, and made it more popular or, or uh, you know, got it into the science press itself. And, and actually last two weeks ago, we were actually talking about the James Webb Telescope, the right. release of those images and redshift is absolutely uh, it's it, it's it's vital to that research and how that works. Yep. So um, so when you take people like down to the Tucson area, what kind of places can you go see? What's going on down there? Well, we'll go out to the uh, Bobo Kovari Mountains, uh, Kitt Peak, okay. and uh, there's the McMath Sun um, Solar Telescope. That's solar right. Telescope. There's another there a tremendous array of uh, telescopes there. Now it's been a while since I've been down there, but. Uh, we also go to U of A has a number of different research projects that are going on there. So we'll go visit some of the scientists and uh, they can share with us the research that they're doing on Mars or uh, Jupiter or, uh, you know, s different star systems and so forth. It's so far I'm familiar with these places and you're taking these people as a tour, but I am aware in both cases uh, just that people can go down and visit these. Anybody yes. can drive up yes. to Kitt Peak. You don't need any special. There's a visitor center there. Um, and so you can just kind of do that on your own. If you want to be a tourist of Arizona and sort of go visit some of these places, there's opportunities. But uh, tell me, especially, I haven't been there for a long time, but they, U of A has this very sophisticated mirror lab, right? And do you ever get into that, get to see what they're doing there? We have not. Okay. Uh, we were planning on going there and then COVID shut our okay. access down for a while. Okay. Uh, but I'm hopeful that this next year that we'll be able to take tours again to where they're making these huge mirrors that, uh, in fact, I think some of them went on the uh, James Webb yeah. telescope. I believe that's true. I believe that's true too. And then um, the other thing about U of A also has the Flandro Planetarium. Mm -hmm. It also has a visitor center and a museum attached to it. So. Uh, so you can certainly learn a lot more about what they do down there with those. And then um, we call those in southern Arizona, I don't know if you've ever heard this term, it's called sky islands, right? So just the, the topography of the state is that we have these big mountain ranges that just shoot up plains. It's called basin and range. There are really desert plains and then these, these mountains just shoot up 8, 9, 10, 11,000 feet. And that tends to be a really good place to plop an observatory. So dotting all over southern Arizona, not only Kitt Peak, but on top of Catalina, uh, the Catalina Mountains, on top of Mount Whipple next to Tucson, mm -hmm. uh, Mount Graham, which right. is a little bit more to the east. Uh, this is really part of that story of Arizona as an astronomy state, is this is a place to, to put those observatories because we have the conditions of very high, very dry, controlling the light pollution, we have this opportunity to do this. We're also in the southern part of the United States because you're, uh, there's an advantage to being closer to the equator right, than, uh, than up in the northern part. So all of these things are accessible and available. But tell me a little bit more about some of the observatories that just in the neighborhood. Lowell's here, but there's other things going on in the forest here, right? Well, uh, yes. Uh, Lowell actually has a multi-mirror uh, facility that's uh, Golly, I haven't thought about this in a long time. We're actually going to have a Lowell but, guest on next, right? Somebody from here, so we can yes, sort of save some of the details. It's uh, mm -hmm. uh, an incredible observatory that is out in the uh, Co Coconino National Forest. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, please. But there's your, also, your um, I have been able to visit uh, the U.S. Naval Observatory mm -hmm. as an interferometer in an area called Anderson Mesa, and it literally is about 10 miles south of Flagstaff. 
that's fascinating. It's amazing the research they do there. And it's, a, it's also a one of a kind. It's, uh, it's really amazing. And then you'll find out later, Lowell is also expanding. They're building some new facilities up here. So you'll find out a little bit more about that here. Did you have another? Well, there's also uh, a consortium of colleges that have a series of telescopes that are out by Lake Mary. Okay. And uh, they have their uh, summer, well, year round programs. And so folks that are studying astronomy, maybe in New York or Montana or Florida, they may come here uh, to actually get their time on the telescope and actually do some research. Uh, so it's a, a consortium of different universities and colleges across the US. We are going to um, drop some links uh, for you guys, either in, during the program tonight or we'll send them to you with our recap afterwards in a couple of days. But there are, I, I just encourage you to sort of take advantage of this. If you want to, if you have out of town guests, out of state guests, you want to come in, you want some place to drive to to go visit, you've got so many choices here and these are amazing. And, and one of the ones, my favorite, one of the reasons we're here is because uh, Lowell Observatory is venerable and historic and it really is a great place to visit. I'm sure. going to transition a little bit if I can. Sure. The other part we're going to talk about is kind of ancient history. Um, we know that there are many cultures that have lived in this land uh, since pre-Columbian, pre-discovery, pre-Spanish uh, conquest from, uh, from Mexico, uh, and they've lived here continuously. And so Arizona and the Southwest actually have a, an interesting thing going on here, but uh, as in continuous occupation of civilizations that have been here for thousands of years, and the conditions are right to have uh, uh, runes have uh, 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 and buildings that we can go visit, the things that we can discover archaeologically, and by um, uh, partnering with Native Americans that are here today, we can really paint a great picture about how people sort of use the night sky historically and uh, back for thousands of years. We have lots of places here to do that. So I'm going to ask Brian first because I'm aware that he did this. Before I met Brian, before I really got interested in cultural astronomy in a big way, uh, I found out there's this a series of uh, conferences that are worldwide. They're called the Oxford Conferences. And there was one hosted here, Oxford 7. And I'd like to have Brian explain that a little bit and how that might have launched uh, sort of some really uh, piqued the interest of people to develop cultural astronomy projects here in, in the Southwest. Well, very quickly, the Oxford International Conference on Cultural Astronomy uh, actually began at Oxford University in England. Okay. And uh, a number of historic figures put that together. It's been uh, located in different towns. I first attended the fifth Oxford International Conference in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Okay. Uh, I went to the sixth one in the Canary Islands with a high school student of mine who did some of the research that we may go through today. It's a, uh, uh, a calendar site of the Northern Sinawa. And then uh, a fellow by the name of Dr. Ed Krupp, who is a personal friend of right. both Rick and, my, and me, uh, approached me about uh, putting in a proposal to host the seventh Oxford International Conference here in Flagstaff. And I hemmed and hawed and finally said, okay, I'll, I'll put in a proposal because he had said, we've got three other sites that we're looking at also. Well, guess what? You, you won. I, yeah, I won. And then you had to put and it in. And then it was, uh, it was a major effort, but uh, uh, I did, uh, you know, work with Todd Bostwick, with uh, Ken Zoll. Uh, Todd with, was at, uh, let me see, Pueblo he, Grand in Phoenix, and yes. he was the archaeologist for the city of Phoenix. For he many was a years. city archaeologist for yeah. Phoenix, and he's now the director of the Verde Valley That's Archaeological right. Center. Which is actually not that far from here, at, uh, in about, uh, about an hour south of here. A wonderful place to visit if you're traveling up I-17. Uh, stop in the Verde Valley region uh, and uh, go to the Verde Valley Archaeological Center. Back to what, the, what attracts an international archaeologist. Uh, uh, archaeoastronomy conference such as Oxford, what attracts them to bring people from around the world to Flagstaff, Arizona? Well, the attraction was that uh, Northern Arizona University uh, got on board. Uh, Dr. Uh, Laura Hunicky was very, very supportive of it, as was Dr. Dave Best. And uh, so we had the institutional support of the university. Uh, we had the use of the facilities, and I was able to 
you know, work with the university and a lot of other locations, Lowell Observer, excuse me, Lowell Observatory was a sponsor of this conference, Okay. Uh, as was the National Forest, the National Parks, and so forth. The point behind it is that we were able, we were in a good place where we could take people and have folks from around the world uh, come join us and and share their research, whether it was in Europe or in uh, Africa or South America. Uh, I don't think we had any presentations. No, I take it back. We did have presentations from uh, Asia. Uh, so it was truly an international conference. But uh, it came about because we were, uh, I was asked to uh, pick up the reins and, and, and go for it, and it worked. The interesting thing for me about it was that uh, during a couple of our debriefing meetings, a fellow named Dr. Steve McCluskey, who is yep. also a, uh, a longtime friend and a mentor of and mine, an author, a, a, a author. tremendous author, mm -hmm. an exceptional uh, researcher and writer. At any rate, yeah, he made the statement to me uh, and uh, some other folks that what we really need was to have more regional conferences so that we could then be vetting uh, the research that's done locally and regionally, and then have those come to the international or national and international conference. And so out of that, uh, a fellow, Todd Bostwick, Ken Zoll, myself, uh, we pulled together the Conference on Archaeoastronomy of the American Southwest. And that was in 2009, I believe. Uh, at any rate, from there, we ended up having uh one conference in the verde valley uh, a couple a year later we we're that's about where i got on board i started to join kind of about back then so that was it yeah. huh that was it yeah okay and then we had one in phoenix at the uh museum there the uh, oh golly uh pueblo grand pueblo grand yes and then we started uh moving the conferences around uh, that over time then became the Society for Cultural Astronomy of the American Southwest, which is it brings us right to both Brian and I are board members on that particular yep. organization, and uh, it really is a great organization. We don't talk about it much on this program. It doesn't really relate that much to my work at ASU. It's more something I do um, kind of as a sideline, but it's absolutely fascinating. And we get out into the field. We actually did some work very recently. In fact, I shared it with the audience. Uh, some of the work we did up at Escalante mm -hmm. about a month ago, right. and so so that's really what that's about. And uh, but uh, I, I'm going to take that opportunity to sort of segue again. I'm aware that Brian has done a lot of research in this area, so he and I were talking before the show. I wanted him to just kind of show us a little bit about three different uh, sites, uh, cultural sites that have uh, that are in the region right here. And uh, uh, the, these are among about seven or eight or ten that uh, that Brian can talk about. We just didn't have time for that, so I really wanted to kind of just focus on a couple of these. Let me just see if I can call this up as a slideshow. I think I can do it, <clears throat> and uh, then uh, we will uh, just start that. Start that. Does anybody see what's going on there? Do we have that on screen? Sorry about that. Not yet. Saw that. Is that better? And I can launch that. You're good. And that's Brian. Is that you? That's me. Okay, okay. Yeah. Can't that's you tell me from that big smile? So, Brian, I'm going to just kind of run your slides, and we don't have a lot of time, so we've got to, like, kind of whip through a little bit. But uh, if you can kind of just give us an idea, this is some of the objectives and the idea about cultural astronomy, what we do. Well, basically, uh, what we as cultural astronomers do is spend a lot of time in the library learning about the culture. Uh, we come up with... Uh, places that we think may have been have uh, astronomical significance to native peoples. And then we try to decipher whether or not an interaction is actually happening, if it's important. And then we ask ourselves, how was this information used by the native people? Mm -hmm. And it's really the latter part, the how was the information used that uh, is really fascinating. And, and a huge transform transformational <clears throat> shift happened about five, eight years ago, something like that, where we, we just sort of you know, found out we can't be insular. We can't be out sort of like poking around the desert, exploring these by ourselves. We actually, it, it, it's silly to do that without engaging the Native American community that is surrounding us. And so we've been very, very successful at kind of working with Native Americans. And I think you guys, uh, my audience, 
uh, you guys have met Mary Wiaki from uh, New Mexico, and she's been kind of part of our program. And those are some of the ideas. We can't do it in isolation. We do it with that research, with that conversation. It's been working out very well. Here, I'm going to push us along. Well, I want to mention real quick, we had a 2019 conference in which we had 22 Native American people present the, uh, about their uh, the culture. culture. That was great. Yeah. And that was here, that was actually on the NAU campus. That was on the NAU campus. So one of the questions that we have to look at first is, how do we know if something's significant? And I covered this in part already, but first you got to look at the ethnographic evidence. You got to go to the library, the research centers, uh, read the documentation, and ask yourselves, hey, did these people actually observe the skies? And how do we know that? Where's the information that, that's documented? Secondly, when you're on site, you have to ask yourself, could an observer actually anticipate an interaction between this light shadow line and whatever it is that it's uh, being crossing? And so there's a picture here of a site, uh, a northern Sanawa site. I think we have some more slides and, here. Well, oh, no, that's, that's no, this is a different. Okay, never mind. Uh, at any rate, uh, so then you have to say, could they anticipate uh, an event happening? And in this case, yes, they can. And I think we may come back to these satellites. Yeah. Yeah. And the last thing, as I said earlier, is how was the information used by the culture? That's really what's the critical question behind cultural astronomy, in my perception. Go ahead, please. Uh, this is some research I did in the Grand Canyon. Uh, golly, when was this? This was 1996. You're asking me? Yeah, uh, I'm guessing there. <laughs> but it was, uh, at, at any rate, this is at uh, Hilltop Ruin. It's, uh, it's about 72 miles downstream from Lee's Ferry, if you know where that is. Oh, and you have to get to this from inside the Grand Canyon, right? So you're, you this have is a to river eat. trip first, and then you. Yes, okay. this was a river trip, uh, one of my many, which I dearly loved. And so I was uh, a volunteer with the uh, Grand Canyon National Park. I took my surveying equipment uh, set up, and you can see this theodolite there that I was using. And then uh, I think in the bottom picture, yeah, will that scroll up at all? You might be able to see the round circle of stone. But at no, any rate, uh, what ends up happening is... Uh, that the summer sun will go across the large peak on the summer solstice, that's Comanche Peak, and then it moves across that uh, kind of uh, serrated uh, cliff edge, and so you can see the cross-quarter dates, those are halfway between a solstice and an equinox, as well as the equinox. And then if you go to the next slide, uh, what ends up happening is that uh, oh, in this one, you can see the circle of stone, uh, just a bit of it there at the bottom by the uh, theodolite. And what ends up happening is that you can watch the sun every day of the year as it rises across the eastern horizon. And the Grand Canyon is a tremendous place for this because you have so much there's variance. So much, yeah, there's ridge lines and yes. there's peaks for you to see. Now, sure. uh, in there's this the one, circle there, right? The better picture of it. Right? Yes, and so you can see the circle of stones at the bottom, and then I put a little dot, a little yellow dot there, yeah, okay. and that's where the sun rises on the winter solstice. Now, the importance that happens here is that you have the physical alignment, but in addition, the bear clan and the Sun Clan used to be at uh, what's called Uncar Delta, and that's very, very close to this site. And they could have gotten there easily. They made a, they had to cross the river, but uh, they could have done that by making reed boats. But the point I'm getting at is that both the Bear Clan and the Sun Clan are involved in the winter solstice ceremony, and that's likely the more significant one here because it ties to them culturally. And it would have told them, when is the sun going to begin to return? Right. When is it going to come back so that we're headed back to warm weather? And then you can use the horizon as a planting uh, calendar. But more importantly, what you're doing is that you're uh, looking at how these people merge their uh, use of the sun motion to tell them what moon they were dealing with, and then the moon time 
is what tells them which ceremonies and which survival activities they perform. So knowing these, we use the term anticipatory, right? So yes. Sort of like watch the movement, understand the movement, and then you sort of have a clue into how the season is going to change a week from now or in a month from now. And Correct. Sort of anticipate all these things. Okay, we got to move a little faster, but I'm going to move you a little bit. So. Okay. Yeah. So this is that northern Sanawa site that I showed you, and Rick, we're going to kind of uh, tumble through these because these are a progression of a shadow okay. dagger, and that shadow dagger is caused by a rock protuberance up above uh, that you don't see in this picture. So next okay. one, and can you see? Oh, I see the, the dagger now. The kind dagger as it's middle. coming up through the it. center, up on the top, and if you continue, uh, it's going uh, all the way off the top. And then looking down towards the right, if you back up, yeah, you can see where the light is coming all across the left hand side of the petroglyph and it's intersecting at a point that Dr. Bostwick believes is related to uh, shamanic travel. Uh, and that gets us into a whole different conversation, it, and a I different one. I think we see cross culturally this, this, this spiral notion is always a Sometimes it's many times used as a transference, as a as a portal, as a as a as a gateway, if you want. To That's been hypothesized. Right. What's okay. interesting here is that this is actually marking a lot of the women's ceremonies, okay. and the women's ceremonies happen between uh, during the springtime from February to May, and then from uh, August to October. Uh, mm -hmm. Men's ceremonies happen during the summer and the winter. All right. And this is just a diagram kind of shows how that how that works. Yeah, I just is a, a diagram that I drew, uh, but it shows you the different light shadow interactions across the petroglyph at different points in time. Mm -hmm. So this, I believe, is a, a sacred site to the native people. Uh, and then the I'm going to move on. Oh, just we have we've just got a couple minutes to just kind of whip through what Potki and so what Potki is a national monument. Uh, it's also very visitable. There's a great visitor center there, and you can actually sort of park in little parking lots and get into and see and walk around a lot of these sort of these runes that are preserved there. Uh, Brian had done some work up there, and I, he and I, on separate trips, visited this place called Kraken Rock. What's Kraken kind of Rock, and basically there are windows that you can see in that wall. Those windows now, yep. uh, you, one of the see portals, one right you can see there. right through it. Yep. And if we keep going. Uh, that's a picture of the sun uh, angle light, uh, and it tells us, you know, you can use that as a meter of time. Let's uh, move on because we're going to move out of time. And uh, the next picture is, this is uh, the October 31st and February 2nd uh, sunrise through the south window. That's tied to the Huamuya ceremony. The next one is the uh, equinox. Excuse me, that is incorrect. It is the May 1st and August 6th cross quarter time, which is related in May to preparation for planting. And then the final one, the next picture is the summer solstice. And that then is in relation to the Niman ceremony in which the Katsinas, which is the spirit of those who have passed away, the Katsinas uh, return to the San Francisco peaks right here in Flagstaff. And then they return with the wind, bringing the clouds, and that's where the rain comes from. Which is what we're experiencing today. Actually, yes, thank absolutely. goodness we're not experiencing rain right now. This is really good. Okay, uh, so um, I'm just going to sort of steer us to a close here, but uh, this is one of the fascinating places, things about this. These rock walls are different than we see in other places around the southwest. They're, that's correct. They're, they're laid differently. They're very thick, and oftentimes these little sort of little window portals are kind of included in these. And there's lots of different speculation about how the little portals were used. We're not going to argue that they're exclusively astronomical, but there are times when they, oops, have a, uh, where they have a, uh, a link to a horizon yes. and, uh, and then they can, we can use them that way. So um, excellent. Here's another sort of just, you can see that how those, um, those walls are stacked and how the portals. And those portals now have a very, very specific direction. And that is what allowed me to connect that with the different clans, the different societies, and then to uh, share with Hopi people about these uh, 
light shadow interactions. And I've it's taken great. a number of Hopi people to this site. To this site. Just to kind and of I have gone up to the Hopi Nation and shared this with uh, the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office. And I think I see Mount Humphreys in the background there, right? That so is the San Francisco the, Peaks. There you go. Okay. We, uh, I'm getting the signal that we have to kind of, kind of bring that part to a close. Um, do I have to stop share or do I have it? Are we good? Yeah, so what we're going to do now uh, is I'm going to hang on to Brian for just a little bit. I'm going to ask two things. One is we have an audience poll. Let's go ahead and launch that. And we just want to kind of get a sense of our audience. And uh, our next guest will also be interested in this one. The, uh, the question is, have you ever visited Lowell Observatory? And it looks like, goodness sake, everybody's weighing in. We're kind of 50-50. Brian, so this is not not bad. So, and really, our audience is mostly Phoenix, but so maybe we're going to swing, uh, sway some heads here. We're going to convince some people to uh, uh, to make their way up to uh, Flagstaff and sort of visit what we're visiting tonight. Absolutely. Uh, and and then I was going to ask if uh, if any of the questions uh, uh, pertain to Brian. If we have any audience questions, and I'll remind the audience that you can just use your little question button, get on. If you're sort of interested in something we're talking about. If you want some uh, more information about what we're talking about, um, we're sort of this is a good time to do that. Uh, so, Alex, we got two questions. Um, I'll, I'll repeat them. Go ahead. Actually, one of the questions was great. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> so, so Greg, we're laughing because Greg is a colleague of ours, and he's always thinking about how to how to put the the, the well, Society for Cultural Astronomy in the American Southwest in front of people. So we will actually also uh, include links to that. We have a great web page, and if you want to get involved, there's ways to do that. And we've got some really cool things that people can participate in on a variety of levels. So so absolutely, we'll do that. So and then what's the next one? Oh. Yes, there are some cultural astronomy sites there. I have not visited them, but uh, I know that Evelyn Billow and Robert Mark have both been down, and they are rock art researchers. They're, they are. They and, are and top, top of the yeah, line. Yeah, I agree. Uh, at any rate, I know that they have done some work down in the Yuma area, I believe it is. And one of the things I want to share is that I think it was Ed Krupp who said this, that uh every culture that's ever been studied has its own astronomy well, that's so if you take the time to look people have been observing the skies for ages and it's not just people it's the birds it's insects it's all sorts of things in fact you have major reproductive events that often happen uh related with the change in the direction of the sun motion at the solstices whether in the south or north hemisphere Lots to research. I yeah. would also add uh, that another colleague of ours, and, and Charlotte, uh, I know you're a follower, uh, uh, will probably do something like this again. Another colleague on our board actually lives in the Yuma area, and he does a lot of his research in uh, Southwest. So he's probably a better person. We'll sort of wait for another time to do that. And then a site I'd like to sort of point you to, Evelyn uh, Billow uh, and uh, her husband, they spend a lot of time at a thing called Sears Point. Yes, it which is Sears Point. Is, uh, Closer to Gila Bend than it is Yuma, but it is sort of just on the edge of that, you know, big basin just south as the Gila makes that curve. And uh, that's a rich place with all kinds of rock art and places. So, so yes, uh, throughout Arizona, New Mexico, southern Colorado and Utah, the Four Corners, and especially uh, this northern Arizona place, is just a tremendous amount of this work going on. So it's a great place to be. And I like to get up here as often as I can. So, uh, um, I think what we need to do is thank you very much. Thank and you, Rick. And this has been great. And when we, uh, you know, we talked about coming up to Lowell and what are we going to do and all this stuff, immediately I, I thought, oh my gosh, I have a friend that lives up there, and he's got a, a wide range of interest in astronomy and and. Uh, and actually, you were a sciences teacher. You were earth sciences, right? Uh, in, uh... I was bi basically biology, chemistry, environmental science, and then I developed the first course in cultural astronomy uh, and taught it the first course west of the Mississippi. Well, there you go. Well, thank you. So, And it's a pleasure knowing you, and we've got many ongoing projects together, but thank you so much for being on our program. Thank you, Rick. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Brian. right -o. You take care. It. All right, so here's what we're going to do. I think I promised everybody before we started that uh, uh, 
uh, Alicia and uh, Armand are out in, they're running around the grounds. They're on Lowell Observatory grounds in the facility someplace. We're just going to go to them, find out where they are, what they're doing, and what they found. Can we do that? There she is. Hey, hey, hey. Observatory. We have some visitors that are just leaving here, and we're excited to get our, our new night guests here. Hi, Going. Okay, um, we so need, need just a little bit more volume, Alicia. Just a little bit more. Oh sorry. no! All there right, you. welcome to the historic Lowell Observatory. We're really excited to be here tonight. Armand, my cameraman, and myself are going to take you on three uh, three separate journeys to our favorite places here at Lowell Observatory. Something we're going to notice is that Lowell is strictly an observatory, whereas the Marston Exploration Theater is a planetarium. So we're not relying relying on the weather as much as Lowell Observatory is. So with all that being said, we're gonna go inside, we're gonna get our day passes, we're gonna get out of the mosquitoes and ask some questions to our Lowell observers. So follow me inside. Good. And Alicia and Armand, if you could just up the volume just a little bit more when she gets inside too, that would be great. We're having just a little trouble hearing you. <laughs> can, you uh, can you cut mine? It's fine, yeah. It's fine. Welcome to the visitor center. We're very excited to uh, talk to some staff here. We're going to ask them some questions and uh, see what's going on at the Lowell Observatory. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Doing well, thank you. We just had a couple of questions if you wanted to introduce yourself, maybe, and uh, yeah, tell us what you do here at the Lowell Observatory. Well, I'm Rowan. I'm a considered experience associate. I help guests and facilitate. Uh, most welcome yeah, to yeah. Hostel in the Old Observatory. And uh, this is Steve, who I'll let you tell him about himself. Hello, I'm a supervisor. I've been here for just over a year. Correct. And he's telling you what he's going to give you guys a lot. Yeah, that's that Alicia, good. can you have them speak up just a little bit? Yes, yeah, so it sounds like we're having trouble hearing you, but this is Rowan and this is Steve. They're here at our visitor center and they are here to make sure that everyone's having a great time up at Lowell Observatory. Um, everyone's safe and able to observe uh, permitting the weather. So um, make sure you come and say hi to Steve and Rowan if you come up to Lowell Observatory. Uh, and of course, make sure you check out the fun gift shop over in the corner. But with that being said, we're gonna pass it back to you, Rick. Give us just a sec. <laughs> Live TV. <laughs> oh, wow, yes, Pluto is on it. So, and hey, we're back, sorry about that. You need to start. <laughs> At least, thank you. And and I don't know who those people were behind the counter, but they looked friendly and amazing. So so uh, we're trying to we're trying to kind of keep ourselves organized over on this end. And then look in the background over here. See all those coats? See those people over there? Uh, they're actually sort of they're taking a tour right now. So this place is open, and we're just thrilled that it isn't raining like crazy. In Flagstaff today, it rained hard, like maybe even unseasonably hard for this time of year. And it, uh, so we were sort of like, as we were kind of like going through this and on our way up here and making, you know, kind of getting ready to launch all this equipment, we're trying to find, you know, we're just watching the weather. But so far, it's holding. Yeah. So far, it's going to work. And so uh, let me introduce my next guest. And, and he and I have not met before. Before. Uh, we were looking for somebody that is a, sort of a, a member of the Lowell Observatory community, somebody that works here and uh, sort of does it to be a guest. And uh, really just sort of there's been lots of travel. There's been sort of lots of people sort of in and out uh, on the Lowell staff. Uh, uh, but I just I finally learned that we actually have an amazing guest tonight. So I'm going to introduce Brian Skiff in a minute. But I also want you to uh, we're going to just be talking about just give him a little preview uh, uh, a little bit more about the history of this observatory because it's historic, uh, but also uh, the research that's going on now. I mean, there, we can talk about all the important discoveries of the past and some of the things like Brian was mentioning redshift. I had no idea. Uh, sort of kind of was it was sort of started here. Uh, we uh, so we uh, not only those things in the past, but there's stuff going on right now. And uh, Brian Skiff, my guest, is also a researcher here. And I'm going to stop there, let you kind of introduce yourself and what you do here and how. And I know you've been here for like 40 years. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, go, go ahead, Brian. So I'm a, a research assistant at the observatory, basically a guy who runs telescopes. 
a colleague of mine says that, that I'm the only only real astronomer she's ever met. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> this is a colleague who's the she's the chief project scientist at the Hubble Space Telescope. Oh. So <laughs> she sits and does administrative kinds of things, figuring out how to divvy up the time on the space telescope. But but you're um, a real astronomer. Actually, I'm a I'm a real astronomer by <laughs> by uh, actually using telescopes and going out and taking data okay. on a lot of nights. Okay. And then so. Um, and then I think you're, if I heard the history right, I remember sort of you're like, uh, you were like grew up in Flagstaff? No, uh, actually I, I came here to go to school you did. 40, oh, at NA, 45 NAU? years, almost okay. 50 years ago now, okay. and uh, decided the very first semester that this was home, having grown up in Florida and seeing the novelty of winter weather and such things, which I still enjoy. Good. And uh, uh, so, but I've been wanting to do astronomy since I was a little kid, so that's perhaps not so unusual. And I want to dig a little deeper into what you were just talking about. So um, if you look at any, what's that? <laughs> oh, is she? Oh, so we're, we're being bothered by the <coughs> tourists in the background. Look at them go. Okay. And so they're actually getting ready. They're going to they're gonna go get themselves set up in a new location. But um, it, this is something a lot of people don't uh, necessarily understand, and so let's dig into that a little bit. But if you look at some of the historic photographs of, of e even Lowell Observatory, you'll see a picture of an astronomer, Percival Lowell. And he's like at a telescope, yeah. and he's got a jacket on, and <laughs> they're up in his driving cap. Usually. And so, and his, so, and they're up, you know, kind of in the middle of the night, and it's yeah. freezing cold, and there's an assistant running around, and they're literally looking through a telescope and seeing right. things and sketching and drawing and taking notes and all that stuff. And well, that is historic. And today, uh, most uh, observational astronomy, of course, is very, very automated. It's all now we have cameras, of course, first plate photography and emulsion photography, and right. digital photography, and and all that stuff. So, so now, I guess, you know, how many astronomers actually look through a telescope, or is it all uh, gathering data through data? Well, well I'd say in, in, the, in the professional world, it's zero. Okay. <laughs> I mean, about, basically, you can say you can say that about the time Percival Lowell started observing, working here, and setting up the observatory, was about the time of the transition from visual, purely visual astronomy to that newfangled technology of photographic plates, and and you taking images. On, on photographs um, in order to be able to measure the sky in either stars or planets in the case of, of Lowell um, just so that you couldn't didn't have to rely on your rather unreliable yeah. eye well um, and you only see for a second right you assimilate what's in the image right, right now yeah. with and photography of so course there, you can do time yeah. you can so that you can sketch yeah, there things. are limitations people recognize that there were limitations to visual observing of all sorts, whether it was, uh, um, you know, being able to see things that were faint or things outside of the visible realm, yeah. and people knew that these things were there, but didn't. Uh, there was until the technology came along, it really, it really wasn't a way to to um, to start getting a handle on it. But people were aware of these things even 120, even 140 years ago. That's great. And so that technology, of course, that basically the detector technology is greatly advanced, whereas the um, uh, you know, technology involved in actual telescopes is only, I would say, really only incrementally advanced in the sense that you can make big, a lot bigger telescopes and you can make them better. But uh, uh, the fundamental, you know, it's, it's thing, a light, it's thing a of a telescope is pretty much the same as it was. It's a light uh, bucket. It's yeah, collects the, light. Yeah, and, and, and you can do process. things, you know, in different ways. And it's that's oversimplifying things, but but uh, it does it does. It, the real change has been in the detectors and the way we record the light and the information that stars and galaxies are broadcasting about themselves. Let me add, let me make it personal. When's the last time you had to stay up all night doing a project? Oh, well, as I get older, it's harder and harder to do. <laughs> okay. um, I, uh, we, for instance, our, our, our flagship telescope, the uh, Lowell Discovery Telescope, which is a 4.3 meter telescope, is uh, operated is run the in, the telescope itself is run by a telescope operator and generally on winter nights they'll have two shifts because they'll have to start in the afternoon to prepare the telescope and then all the very complicated stuff involved with the telescope and then uh, often the nights now for the scientists are divided up into quarter 
nights. So time, sometimes just a couple of hours. But there is a scientist still sort of observing the observers? Uh, and uh, right. The data and, so, and so, well, and, and running the instrument that's running on the, the back end, okay. the business end of the telescope. Okay. And so often, because things are, you know, if the wire is as long as, you know, any, as any, you know, across the, across the table, it can be infinitely long. And so often the observers, particularly in the COVID era, don't come to the telescope, but instead are observing from an office or their office or their kitchen table right. in Maryland or in Boston or wherever they are and they don't have to be on site. And similarly, we and other people can observe, uh, use telescopes in Chile, for instance, or in Hawaii, right. um, and not have to actually go to do the traveling, both, which is both expensive in, in time and in money. <clears throat> and similarly, sp space telescope stuff, including JWST that's just been launched, all that is obviously done on a, on a queue scheduled thing that's uh, set up well in advance and well, so you aren't you aren't up up all night <laughs> waiting for the, and nobody's for the up on the jws and nobody's there right? yeah, so taking doing, the data doing so doing anything. and you just you just launched me into just a ton of questions so so i'm going to just kind of start floating through so um let, can you talk a little bit about sort of uh, sort of some of the major research projects that are happening now and then i also want to focus on your particular field of research what you're doing here at lowell and, so what is Lowell doing in general? Right. What's special? And then kind of you know, then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about we you. We have your about field. a dozen uh, PhD staff members who okay. are, you can almost say they each are doing their own individual thing, but there are small groups within with amongst the amongst the observers or amongst the astronomers. So that we have, for instance, a uh, I guess you call him the asteroid maestro, Nick Moskovitz, <laughs> who uh, is. Um, working uh, both with uh, telescopes on the ground and with spacecraft um, to particularly to characterize the near-earth asteroid population and uh, the, which are getting delivered from the main belt of asteroids between Mars and Jupiter <coughs> and so these are asteroids that just are drifting out of their main belt and right sort of generally, end from, up generally from collisions they get okay. thrown into the inner part of the solar system and they end up in like an orbit a very orbit. elongated orbit that goes out use in the average case out to the main belt and then in past the earth oh, or see, even sorry, okay. past others so very elongated often very elongated orbits and we what we'd like to do is be is to find more of these objects that are going past us slowly enough uh, that we could actually have some chance of sending a spacecraft to them yep. and uh and of course there's the old idea which is is, is inventorying the the near-earth population in the, in the case of wanting to avoid getting hit by something but that's in the last 25 years that the inventorying the surveying of the sky for the for the near-earth asteroids has progressed such that we know of all of the all the big stuff and that's the and, stuff movies are made out of yeah right? and so we know that that none of those things is dangerous and uh, the only things that will be dangerous in, 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 com in actually coming to hit us are quite small objects, maybe the size of a bus or something like exactly. that, where they're um, but we do hear, a big, big light in the sky. We do hear about it every once in a while, right? I mean, yeah, we so all, there are big things that come twice, in. Twice a year or every, yes. every once in a so while, these, big things, news things, sort of big, huge, you know, near miss. Big, big light giant, in the sky. Yeah, well, they are, <laughs> some of them do actually hit us. And, and uh, of course, most of them come in over the ocean, so often are not observed. But in the last few weeks, there have been ones over in Italy and in Australia and elsewhere um, where there have been things that are probably, you know, basketball size that have come in yes. and make a big light in the sky and even a sonic boom and probably yes. some crumbs make it to the ground the size of a strawberry or something sure. like that um, but nothing really dangerous <clears throat> we were able to uh, i guess it's been a month ago now but um, we took our audience into our meteorite vault right at oh, asu mm -hmm. have you been down to yep, uh, yep. that facility and so so it's kind of that's a language we speak right so the asteroids are up there uh, this debris and rocks, and they're jostling around, and they sort of become dangerous. But you know, we could just sort of examine them once they've become an object on the Earth and rock. And, you know. So, other of the astronomers uh, work, I guess, working progressively outward from from Earth, uh, work on comets okay. and looking at uh, chemical abundances in comets. Um, another another astronomer, uh, Will Grundy, is working on, uh, uh, and another astronomer, uh, Audrey Thirwan, who's from France. Uh, working on s small bodies in the outer solar system, like Pluto, but much uh, often beyond Pluto and smaller. Um, 
Uh, we have folks working on stars. Before you get off of comments, do, do I know that a couple of comments have the skip name? Yeah, so, I, so as part of surveying for the asteroids, we ran a, a modest uh, near-Earth asteroid search, search uh, between about 1998 and 2008. And in the course of that, uh, we found about 40 comets altogether. <laughs> okay. um, but that, was, that wasn't what you were looking for, but it was a, right. it was so a byproduct that, of the... They, is, when you do any kind of surveying, you find stuff like that. Yes, and yes. so uh, a dozen of those have my name attached. Good and so it's, that's part of the, one of the perks of doing, staying up on all those nights. Again, I'm, on, <laughs> I'm honored to, 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 to be, have you at my table. This is really super cool. Okay, didn't mean to interrupt. So moving out. out we have people working on stars and stellar systems, okay. um, whether it's hot stars uh, in star forming regions or uh, um, uh, young stars that are mostly about the mass of the sun. So Lisa Prato, who's on our staff, heads up a group of folks, including me, who uh, study these young stars and planets forming around the very young stars. We also have folks working in, on the, in the extragalactic realm, uh, both at radio and, and visible wavelengths. Mm -hmm. And so there's quite a range of expertise and a uh, wide range of interests on the staff. I didn't realize you're covering that many bases. I really yeah, didn't know. Uh, so well, it keeps good. things interesting. Good. And then back to you. So, so what, <laughs> what are you going so to work thinking as about? I, as I said at the beginning, I'm just the guy who runs the telescope. Okay. And I have an, you know, an, a sort of an abiding interest in stars and stellar rotation and star clusters. Uh, but on any given night, I could be looking at um, uh, asteroids, uh, comets, and stars all mixed in together, sort of an omnibus kind of observing at the okay. telescope for various people. So and in so, the technology of the observing, making the telescopes work, optimizing them to their best. Well, it's mostly in, in my case, uh, just taking pictures. Okay. Um, either either to just to measure the brightness of stars, say, or um, for the comets. Uh, I often do the observing where we take images of the comets in various narrowband filters that isolate uh, gas emission from the comets and looking at jets and comparing the gas jets coming out of the nucleus of the comets with the dust <clears throat> that also comes out of the comets that actually draws, that gets drawn out by the gas um, as the comets go around the sun. We're, we're going to start to run out of time a little bit, and I'm really sorry about that. But before <laughs> I get to, I have one bit more big question for you. Before I get to that, I want to remind the audience that uh, uh, that w w Brian's going to hang around for a little bit. So if you submit some questions in the question and answer button, trying to keep that moving, uh, then in a couple of minutes, we're going to we're going to go to you. Another poll question and some audience questions. So where I was going to go here is just in general, the inventory of telescope technology that's available on the hill here and then do I get the idea that a lot of your researchers aren't only working here or working on telescopes here but maybe telescopes around the world and right maybe so we have a fa two facilities basically outside of Flagstaff away from the city lights uh -huh. um, one at Anderson Mesa where we have two or three telescopes and then the discovery, uh, the Lowell I, Discovery Telescope. I've been to the Discovery Telescope. Yeah, way out for is out at Happy Jack, about yep, yep. about an hour's drive. Yep. And southeast that's an of amazing. Town. I got a chance to get into that dome and see that. It's yeah, that's a awesome. real 21st century telescope. It's, oh, it's awesome. It really <laughs> so it's is. wonderfully instrumented, which is great. And we have people uh, involved in the consortium of of uh, astronomy departments around the country that are involved in helping to run the thing, uh, building instruments for that telescope as well. So I mostly observe at our 42-inch telescope, which is at Anderson Mesa, which is a 50-year-old telescope. Um, 42 inches. I'm just trying to get so it. So okay, the diameter so, of the okay, mirror yep, got is, it. is it's about a meter. Not quite the size inches. of this table. But yeah. maybe, okay. And uh, it's a telescope I've been using since I was 19 years old. Are you kidding me? And, uh, <laughs> so, um, it's, it's my favorite does, telescope does, in the observatory. Does anybody use the old, like, historic telescope? Well, not to it? do any science. Not, um, not for science, yeah, but so we, we can still use so them. So on for... Mars Hill here, the Pluto okay. camera and the Clark refractor, which are sort of the, That's the, one I, yeah, the I original remember. telescopes yep. that we had at the observatory, are not used for any science. And there's nothing really wrong with them, but they really aren't suited to taking the kinds of instruments that we have now to collect and analyze okay. the light. Everything sort of yeah, they, I, everything becomes obsolete at some point. But so um, it, it's not your particular role here, but the visitor experience here is is outstanding, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I mean we have this premier facility of the of the uh, 
Uvalde Open Deck Observatory with several sort of amateur oriented, high end amateur oriented telescopes to either look through or we can take images or spectra um, to show how the science actually gets done and, uh, and provide this direct contact with the sky, at least on nights that, where we're able to see the stars. <clears throat> Is it year round or do, do people, yes. do you close in the winter for a little bit? No, nope. no, no, year round. Okay. It's mostly driven by the weather. Right. And uh, we're here even if it's cloudy and even if it's raining, but we try not to get people hit by lightning. <laughs> yeah, that's what I can imagine. We're, and, we're high on a and hill. If, and, if the, and if the snow is a little too deep so that folks can't drive up the hill, then we'll, we'll stay closed for as, that reason. So as, it's mostly the weather. As we were setting up today, and we were kind of like, you know, trying to decide whether it be inside, outside, we really were driven to be outside, but we heard yeah. some gigantic thunderclaps yeah. just sort of yeah. like over the mountain I think over the here. the local stuff is over. It could be that after midnight we might get no, the, this dra is great. the dregs from stuff we, over to the we east. We found a window of dry. It's actually yeah. working and all this stuff. So good. Well, I just think, I think it's amazing. So you've been here, it, you know, the, the observatory has been here since 1894, right? right? And so, and uh, has a historic start, has a lot of uh, things that have been discovered along the way. Pluto is one of them. We're going to hear about that in just a second, I think. Yeah. And, and um, we haven't forgotten Pluto, and we're still doing science. I mean, so a is, lot of people think that it's only the old stuff. But. Wait, is Pluto <laughs> is Pluto a planet? Well, I think it's a planet. Okay, it's, but, e it's <laughs> even it's even better than a planet. There's it's actually a double planet with four moons. So there's six bodies out there yeah, in the Pluto system, not just one. It's it's awesome. And yeah, and and people haven't forgotten Pluto. I think that's actually great. Well, uh, Brian, thanks for making time. Uh, to be right, a guest welcome. here, and I, uh, I, just, I just think it's great that we've been able to kind of the, you, the staff here has been we've been collaborating on some projects, and uh, it was just it, it wasn't much of an ask. We just said, hey, we'd like to do this up there, and they said, yeah, come on up, let's yeah. do this. And so, uh, so it's like a, it was a really great thing, and I'm glad to meet you, and hopefully we can do some more stuff together. And uh, sure, I think that's great. Okay, so hang on though. So here's what we're gonna do. Gonna gonna go to uh, some questions uh, for. Um, for Brian. Wait a second. I just have to, I have to point out that, that Alex is like in a full coat with a hood on now. It's cold. You're, you're, you're making, you're He's making me cold. I got a short on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> anyway. ba yeah, okay. Back it's to, pretty humid. Back to questions. Uh, the answer is, um, uh, <laughs> I guess the answer is no. So not in the sense of having adaptive optics that reacts very fast to the changing turbulence of the atmosphere, which is requires something going very fast, like a, a hundred hertz or a thousand hertz per second. And uh, but we can't. What we can do is to there's the action. The mirror has 120 actuators on the back of it. It's a very thin mirror, even though it's 17 feet across. And so we can actually change the shape of that mirror on a slow time scale, but not on a rapid time scale. We like to have ourselves a an AO an adaptive optic system, but that's a it's a money money and a people thing. And, and maybe a future idea. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, um, so okay. And anyone? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I can do that. Yeah, yeah, so that's absolutely, and, and I think you're going to learn a little bit more about that here. I'll let Brian answer if you can, but we're going to uh, take a couple segments, and you're going to visit the Jivali Gia, um, uh, observatory, observatory yeah. platform here, which is actually a public access platform that people use, and they're using it tonight. So you're going to see some people out there yeah. looking through uh, telescopes, I hope. Maybe they're seeing stars, maybe yeah. not. Uh, but They'll yes, the absolutely. And the question before, so the uh, Joan's question was sort of just about, you know, the visitor experience and does it extend into the night and can you use, do we get to look through telescopes? And the answer is absolutely yes. yes. So, so we can do that. Yeah, so at the moment, through the summer, uh, we'll be open until 11 o'clock in the evening. Um, so there, so it does extend into the, into the night. The research telescopes are not publicly available. And the main thing, apart from seeing them, you can't look through them because we don't have eyepieces to look right. through the telescope. And so uh, coming up to on Mars Hill, where we do have the facility for the viewing, is actually better. Good. Well, that's excellent. And, and another? Uh, there's one more. Okay. Oh, good question. So, Stuart, let me just repeat the question because it's coming from across the room. Uh, uh, Stuart is asking about 
the Happy Jack site, which is the Discovery Lowell Discovery Telescope, is what we're calling that. And can the public get into it? Uh, and the answer is uh, not on a regular basis. Um, <laughs> things can be arranged, but it's a little more complicated. Do you, do you think Luna wants to be on TV, or does she want the treat <laughs> in my hand? Doggy right? treats. Doggy. <laughs> oh, we talked about Pluto, Pluto and Luna got all interested. Oh, I see. One of her ancestors. <laughs> One of her cousins is out there. So, uh, so uh, well, anyway, so, so thank you. Really, really uh, thanks a lot. I appreciate uh, you, you joining us. And I actually really appreciate meeting you and, uh, and hearing more about what's going on up here. So it sounds like uh, we sort of extended our regular programs an hour. We extended to an hour and a half. We probably should have gone to three hours, right? So, so but uh, we'll extend but, whatever time limits you have. You know, we can sort, of, sort of go from here to there. So uh, we just sort of sort of Luna again, getting a, another treat. So anyway, thank you very much. We're going to move on to another segment. Right. I really appreciate you you joining us. Great, thank you. Okay, we have a poll question for you to get the audience back going, and then we are going to try to find Alicia and Arman and see where they are now. Right. So the question we're working on now is where are you viewing this show from? And we sort of like to sort of get a sense of, uh, you know, where people are sort of finding us. And, and it's been actually, you know, we've been, we've been advertising and word of mouth, I think, is the way that we've sort of been gaining some interest, uh, uh, you know, from others outside of the state of Arizona. And it is always just disheartens me that I hear from people every once in a while in another state that just sort of like when they visited or they had somebody to live through that told them about it and all of that stuff. So I just think that's really, really great. And, and uh, as you can see the poll here, the totally two thirds of us are Arizonans. And I would imagine two thirds of those people are probably the, the Phoenix metro area and stuff like that. But Arizona is a great state to appreciate the night sky. And I think we're, we're touching, we're filling a role and kind of keeping people interested and what you can go out and look at and what you can see. So, so we love that. And we love people tuning in from around the U.S. because you're learning about a lot of the current research, the stuff that's going on right now, both at Lowell Observatory tonight, but also you're going to learn about some uh, new mission and a new uh, uh, instrument that we were deploying next week. Or, next, yeah, next week, next Tuesday. You're going to learn about that today. And uh, so that's really what we wanted to do and want to make sure that you guys have uh, uh, a real good sense of, uh, of um, what we're doing, and we love that we have an audience that comes back over and over again. All right, I'm going to uh, close that poll. So it looks like 67% uh, Arizona, 28% uh, outside of Arizona, and uh, uh, or in the US, but outside of Arizona, and six people um, internationally. And I think we know two or three of them uh, because they're, they're relatives or friends, so that's really good. Uh, all right, uh, so uh, Alicia, where the heck are you guys? Alicia, Armand, come in. <clears throat> there they are. Uh oh, so she was there and now she's back. It's live, folks. Uh, Alicia, Alicia, you've sort of gone gone dark. There you are. There you are. Go ahead. So, Alicia, yeah, let me just tell you, so we can see your view now. Let's just, I think maybe being inside that building has kind of upset us a little bit, but uh, anyway, let's try. We'll get started. I think we have no sound from you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll scope it out. I'm going to just tell you, I happen to know they're in a little facility called the Pluto Camera Dome, and there's a bunch of visitors outside. They're right behind me. I can hear them chattering and, uh, and sort of like a, sort of along the way. But uh, so now you've stepped outside. Let's see if we can get your uh, get a, a sound from you now. Mm no maybe not yeah it's, it's a little bit we can we can get some of the the visual images and it's really intriguing i saw a big gigantic telescope in there but we're not really hearing sound from you so so there you are now you're out in the dark nope still, still no sound sorry about that guys 
I'll tell you what, I happen to know you're not very far away. Can you bring your guest over here? Just bring him over. Don't, don't forget you turned me. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, so they, she's, she's making her way through the dark and everything. So yeah, so our great plan was is that, uh, and we'll try this again. So we had a couple of things we wanted to show you tonight. We had a couple of guests, and uh, and uh, we we're trying to kind of get you out about on the facility. And it really is quite a big campus, and there's uh, things to do. It's kind of just as fun for me to visit here during the day because it's a beautiful facility. It's up in the mountains. There's lots of things to visit. There's a visitor center, as you you've already learned, and some other things going on. All right, they've made it back. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, guys. We saw something. So, and uh, and this is Matt, right? Yes. Matt. Okay, I met you earlier today. So let me just uh, let Matt introduce himself and what he does. Okay. Where uh, were you? What were you trying to show us up there? Uh, I was trying to show you the the Pluto Discovery Telescope, which you probably saw, but I couldn't. Yes, I couldn't we saw the telescope. You, I couldn't tell you about it because our sound wasn't working. But yeah, my name is Matt. I'm an educator here at Lowell. Um, so I'll do a lot of telescope operation. I'll do things like this, you know, being on, on shows and stuff. But yeah, pretty good. So I had a couple questions for you, Matt. What was so special about that telescope that we just saw? Well, I'd say for one, it discovered Pluto. So that's, and, that's and pretty... And that telescope, not... That telescope, not, that telescope... That's not a replacement that, something that... Yeah, in that dome, discovered yeah, Pluto. That's yeah. amazing. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty cool telescope. It's actually an astrograph, so it's not a telescope that you can, per se, look through. Um, rather, it is used to take pictures. Um, so how it works, if you saw in the brief image that you saw of it, uh -huh. there's a, a wooden rectangular um, panel on the back. If you were to operate this telescope, uh, you would remove that panel, and then you would install a photographic plate. And these photographic plates... And these are big, right? Yeah, they're, 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 it's uh, like nine by... No, it's probably even bigger than that. I can't give you exact dimensions, yeah, but it's, it's pretty, it's pretty sizable. We have some back in the office. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, these photographic plates are designed so that when you put it in the, the telescope and you expose it to light, um, they change colors. So the photographic plate at the start of the night would be blank, and at the end of the night it would be speckled with black dots. And all those black dots would correspond with star locations. Okay. Well, I know we asked uh, Brian, our guest, and I'd love to get your opinion. Do you consider Pluto to be a planet? Yeah, so I heard his answer, <laughs> and it's it's this can't be a generational it's, it's, it's thing. It's not that it's not that simple. Okay. Um, so Pluto's technical classification is a dwarf planet, um, established by the International Astronomical Union, and they International Astronomical Union, yeah, and they changed the definition um, because we kept finding objects that would have fallen into this classification of planets. Um, so they created a new definition for the planet for a planet, and. What that is, there's three criteria to be a planet. One, you must orbit around the sun. Um, two, you must have enough gravity to pull yourself into a sphere. Um, this is just how gravity works. If you have enough gravity, you're going to pull yourself into uh, almost perfect. You're going to make spherical yourself object. round. Right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and then the third criteria, and I see this as kind of an ambiguous criteria. I'll say how I interpret it. Um, is you must clear your orbit of all like-sized objects. And I think it reads more along the lines of you must clear your orbit of objects, um, and if that were the case, you know, Jupiter wouldn't be a planet because you have the Trojan asteroids and things like that. So that's how I interpret it for the, the definition to make sense. Um, but you have Pluto and then you have Pluto's main moon, Charon, which is pretty massive. It's actually massive enough to um, kind of cause this, as Brian said earlier, uh, this binary planet um, where you have these two planets that are orbiting around a common center of mass. Um, so if you're thinking of like our Earth and our moon, the moon orbits around the Earth, the Earth doesn't really follow. But with these two planets, they're going around each other. Um, Almost tumbling. Like yeah. Okay. Um, Pluto also flies through the area of the solar system known as Kuiper Belt, which is like an asteroid belt out past Neptune. Um, and Pluto just doesn't have enough gravity to either pull these objects into it or launch these objects away from it. And for that reason, I think Pluto is, is classified as a dwarf planet. Um, but as Brian said earlier, it's still a really interesting object. I think we get very fixated on this classification, and, and yeah, yeah, Pluto, yeah. it's got, you know, water ice mountains that are taller than the mountains that are north of us now. They reach up to like 12,000, 14,000 feet of elevation. You have these huge solid nitrogen plains, so it's still a, still a very it's interesting It's an amazing object. thing. And then I use sort of the term sometimes, and maybe it's not the right one, of plutoids, right? And mm -hmm. so what we're discovering, and like Brian was saying, there's some research going on 
for these types of objects in the Kuiper Belt. Yeah. And we're discovering new ones all the time. Yeah. And more and more, uh, like Pluto. In fact, there's one Eris that is actually more massive than Pluto, so it's actually bigger than that. So you can't keep discovering planets and make you know, 11, 14, 25, whatever, yeah, right? There's, there's a new classification of objects and we can use that. Make them right? my very eager mother uh, sentence very long if yeah. it wasn't reclassified <laughs> yeah. <yet. Children>. <laughs> <laughs> Too many planets to memorize. You can't, can't memorize that many. Okay. Well, anyway, thank you very much. Yeah, and so, I'm sorry and the, the, the oh, audio didn't work. But. We, we worked it out. You came here. We met you, and that's great. And, yeah. uh, and that's super. Okay. We're going we're gonna to see Alicia again in another segment. Are you going to join her in there? Uh, I am not going in there. So yeah. Okay. Alicia's gonna, Alicia is going to find another person around Lowell to talk about sort of what's going on in the building next to us. So we'll get back to you in about 10, 15 minutes. Great. Right? Cool. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nice yeah, to meet you, Matt. For having me. yeah, appreciate it. Appreciate it. That's absolutely wonderful. Thanks, Matt. So, all righty. So, uh, the, the next thing we wanted to do is kind of like take you back home a little bit. We've got something exciting happening, uh, 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 sort of associated with ASU research. And so, I'm in about to play a little video for you, and uh, you'll get a little sense of this. But let me just set it up a little bit. Uh, there is a Korean space agency spacecraft that is going to launch next Tuesday or it's scheduled to launch next Tuesday. That's how we sort of say that, because there's things that can happen. Um, and they are actually running this mission, but in an agreement with NASA and in a cooperative international uh, kind of a, a agreement, they asked uh, us, the United States, to submit an instrument that might go on this spacecraft. And so that process happened, and the instrument was selected as being uh, the PI for it, the principal investigator, is our own Mark Robinson uh, at Arizona State University. The instrument is called ShadowCam, and so I think we're gonna play a little video for you so you can see Mark and you can hear him talk about that a little bit, and then we'll sort of give you some more details about that launch and maybe some things you can watch. ShadowCam is a very special, specialized camera. Um, it's basically picking up where we're leaving off with the LROC narrow angle camera, which is right now it's still in orbit around the moon. And our goal now is to completely map all the moon with the narrow angle camera on LROC at one meter per pixel. However, the camera's not sensitive enough to see into permanently shadowed craters. It was designed for this purpose to image those regions on the moon which LROC didn't. So it's that unknown which has been there for years and years and years. And we're expecting ShadowCam to actually fill in those gaps. And the permanently shadowed craters are, have, they're mysterious, enigmatic, because there's thoughts that there may be large deposits of volatiles there, water, possibly even methane and ammonia, because that's where the sun doesn't shine. And so it's very, very cold in permanent shadow craters. So that's the role of shadow cam is to take about two meter per pixel high signal to noise ratio, high quality images in these permanent shadow craters. So the way we're doing this is we took the basic NAC telescope design, but put in a much more sensitive detector. So you can think of it as it made the camera 200 times more sensitive so we can take pictures in the dark. All around us, we can see things because there is light. But what happens to that point, those craters, where the light doesn't really come, right? So what happens is the light bounces off the walls of the crater and then scatters into the bottom. But that's really, really small light, like orders and orders of magnitude less. So shadow cam is way more sensitive than the LROC instrument. It gets to then image in that really low light condition. And it also removes one of the, one of the issues which we had, because LRO was not designed for imaging in those conditions, is that is a factor called stray light, light which comes from outside into your field of view. Shadow cam has a way to stop them. So that way what happens, ShadowCam does what and finishes up what LROC couldn't. And these would be images which we have never seen before.
I'm back. All right, so there's been lots of activity, as you can imagine, in the last week or so. Uh, it's It's been interesting for us to work with this and follow this particular project for, for one of the main reasons is this is this is not being led or run by NASA. And so we have this really sort of good understanding about how NASA is going to deliver information and what we're going to be able to do and how we're going to get it and all of this stuff. Um, but we're really kind of counting on the Korean Space Agency and which is because it's their project to do this. We just happen to have an instrument on board. So we're really intrigued and interested about this. So it is actually launching from a US, uh, um, uh, from Cape Canaveral. It's on a Falcon rocket. And uh, some of our team is going to be, uh, some of the LROC team is going to be in Florida when it launches. And uh, so we'll see that. But just like we were having weather here, weather in southern Florida this time of year is iffy. And uh, the, the, they, they, they sometimes can't choose uh, the time of year that they actually do these launches. These things come up, they get out there. And so we might watch it go out and get ready and get into the countdown. And then we'll find out thunderstorms or winds or something going on. So, so we're going to watch very closely to see that. And, and we'll bring more to you uh, in the future. Um, just to remind everybody, because we tripped into that, and I just wanted to remind maybe our new viewers what LROC means, uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiting Camera. And LROC is the short for that. Uh, LROC is a spacecraft. The camera suite, a uh, suite of narrow angle and wide angle cameras are the, the LROC cameras, the cameras in LROC, and we run those from ASU. And we've been on that project for, I guess, approximately 13 years now. I always look to Meg to give me you know, sort of some backup on that answer because she uh, she's, was with them when it launched and she's been around for a long time. Uh, but that's very exciting for us. And then if in the near future, we also alerted you several months ago to some upcoming missions. And there's one uh, kind of that's called Luna Map. Uh, we don't know, still doesn't have some final dates for it, but we do expect that to go also. August 29th is their new target. I'm hearing this as we go through. And so, but both of these projects is about uh, understanding the resource of water and how water distributes itself on the moon. Yeah. 30, 40, 50 years ago, right? I mean, we were aware that there was traces of water. Now through analysis and through mapping and through our ability to sort of determine these things, we're discovering there's a lot of water. And these permanently shadowed regions, these deep craters that never see the light of the sun have become of great interest. So both of those projects, Shadow Cam launching next week, Luna Map launching uh, at the end of August, both of them are involved in that particular research, uh, categorizing, mapping, and understanding the quantity and how that water is distributed as ice in these deep craters on the moon. So, so we're really looking forward to that and see how that goes. Uh, I'm going to uh, then see if Alicia is ready again. Uh, she's moved to another location, and uh, and uh, so let's see if we can get her on, and we'll see if we can. We have the backs here. here. And Sorry. I actually hear her voice. This is good. Oh. <laughs> Hello, Rick. Hi, I'm here with my friend Wolf. Uh, Wolf, do you want to tell us what you do here at Lowell Observatory? Yeah, so I'm one of the educators here. So. Um, we're just pretty much everyone you interact with outside of the front desk. Uh, so we're the ones who give the talks. Uh, we're stationed in each of the domes and we operate the telescopes. Oh, that's wonderful. So Wolf, now that you've kind of given us a little bit of background, can you tell us where we are and what this space is? Yeah, so we're at the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory. Uh, this deck was uh, finished completion in 2019. And so uh, the, we have six telescopes up on this deck. Uh, the two right behind me are going to be our astrographs, which are telescopes that take photos. Uh, so they have really fancy cameras on the back of them, uh, so we are able to take pictures. The remaining four telescopes here on the deck are all optical telescopes that you actually look through with your eyeball. The, six, or the four telescopes are all different sizes, uh, which means that they all uh, can look at different things and have different specialties. Uh, so the white telescope at the behind the pier here, um, the tech is uh, a five and a half inch refractor uh, and it has a triplet lens. And that third lens is a lab grown fluorite crystal, uh, which allows it to focus in the wavelengths of light that say the red telescope with two lenses can't focus. So it produces a really, really crisp and clear image, 
even though it's the smallest telescope here on the deck. Oh, wow, that's wonderful. Can you go into a little more detail as to the differences between all of these telescopes? Yeah, so the uh, the white telescope, since it's the shortest, it'll be able to view larger objects or even multiple objects at once. Uh, so I know that we've thrown uh, the galaxies M81 and M82, which are referred to as both uh, nebulae, um, or also uh, Antares, which is the bright star, and the globular cluster M4 at the same time. As opposed to the red telescope, which is significantly longer, it can't quite uh, look at multiple objects at once because of that long tube. Then we have our 32 inch star section, which looks like a cannon. And uh, that is the biggest telescope that we have on the entire campus. And it is uh, the largest telescope, uh, one of the largest telescopes in the world that is consistently open for public viewing. It is uh, mm -hmm. really good. It is really good at focusing um, uh, really dim and far away objects, uh, which helps with that really big mirror. Wow, that's awesome. Thank you for that explanation. And I know tonight is kind of a difficult night with monsoons and it being overcast, but is there anything special that guests should know if they wanna come and visit Lowell on a maybe a night that's not so overcast? Yeah, so definitely check the weather before you come. Uh, obviously with clouds, we can't look through the clouds, so we're not gonna be able to view on a cloud night. And then the other thing to look out for is if it's windy, um, we, uh, the sea isn't as good when there's lots of movement in the atmosphere. And then the moon, the moon is a very big and bright object. So the bigger the moon is in our sky, the more it's going to cloud out uh, those dimmer objects like galaxies. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us here at ASU. We're really excited to be here and I'm gonna go ahead and turn things back to Rick now. Thank you, Elisa, I have just one quick question for you. Yes, of you course. Um, so I noticed sort of in your view there and all that stuff, it looks really, really dark. And, and that's right because this is an observing place, right? So the whole Correct. building is lit so that it's actually sort of like uh, darker so people can eye adjust and that kind of stuff. Is that what's going on? I'll let Wolf maybe take that one. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we're in an international dark sky city, actually the very first one in the country. And, uh, oh, we can't so hear you now though, sorry. Now, oh, how about now, Rick? Yep, that's good. Okay, yeah, so we're the very first international dark sky city in the world. And uh, we have special laws in place to preserve our dark skies here for the observatory. Uh, we also use uh, primarily red lights, especially when we're viewing. So right now we have white lights on, uh, but when we're viewing, we would have red lights on uh, because the red light doesn't uh, hinder our night vision. That's and right. uh, we don't allow that white light at all. Wow, oh, great to know. So make sure uh, you don't have your flashlights on when you come to check us out. So. I would guess not. Yeah, actually, we were asking if we could use the lights I have on me right now, if it was going to mess, mess anything up. We were assured we're okay. Thank you very much. And did I get your name? Is it Wolf? Wolf, like the animal. Like the animal. Okay, Wolf. You're, you're the first wolf I've ever met. And, uh, and thank you very much. Very informative. And it must be a really it must be a thrill to work here as an educator, right? I mean, yeah, it is great. amazing working here. Um, yeah. It's kind of a dream because I went to school for physics and astrophysics, and so I get to work in my field, which is really awesome, yeah. especially. All right, thank you Wonderful. very much. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Hey, I think we're just really coming to the close of our 90 minutes. I just wanted to um, maybe, I'm going to try this real quick. I'll see, try to show you one more quick thing and I'll show you and kind of wrap up the program at the same time. I would like to give people something to uh, um, sort of visualize, right? So the, um, uh, and uh, in the night sky. And so uh, we're coming up, can you guys see that all right? Is that, is that on screen? Okay, good. So uh, I just want to point out here, I don't know if you can see this really well here, but there's a sun and a moon in this image. When the sun is right next to the moon or the moon is right next to the sun, that's a, uh, that's the phenomenon called the new moon. And uh, that's, this is exactly the time you can't see it. It's not up in the morning. It's not up in the evening, right? It's really right in front of the sun and you won't be able to see that. But if I, if I just move forward a couple of days, you'll see the moon uh, moving and kind of tracking. Here, it's still below the horizon. That's the green part. But by Friday, the moon and Mercury 
should be a you know, crescent moon in a very, very bright star-like object that isn't a star. It's the planet Mercury. And so I'm going to ask everybody to sort of just check it out. It could be cloudy. This is that time of year. Sometimes we don't have access to the night sky. Uh, but just coming up, this is something to look for this week on Friday. And then you can see from the image here, uh, the moon is just going to move up the next uh, several nights. It'll just start keep moving up through the constellation of Leo. It will leave Mercury behind, but Mercury will still be an evening object. This is a good time to try to find it because uh, it's sort of you can see sort of the, the brighter lights around uh, the head of Leo and Mercury right there. So I'm going to kind of just we uh, that's all the time we have for tonight. I was going to sort of spend a little time um, making sure you have at least something to look for. Uh, we'll be back with you in two weeks. We will be back in Phoenix, and we will be back to give you sort of the results of the Shadow Cam launch. Hopefully, it will have happened by then, and maybe some new updates and some new things. And uh, we're going to spend some time in August uh, talking about observing again some phenomena and some constellations that are available to us now uh, because they happen to be in the sky this time of year. And uh, and uh, we'll have uh, action-packed programs for you as well in August, uh, in two weeks from now, and then four weeks from now. And I really appreciate you staying with us for the extra half hour tonight. And I want to thank publicly everybody at Lowell that has been very, uh, the hospitality has been amazing. We felt very welcome here. We've got a great little setup here, and it's been fun for us to get away from the valley for a couple hours to, uh, to pre present from here. So again, from our your team, your virtual night size team, uh, from Lowell Observ Historic Lowell Observatory, um, have a great night, and really thank you for joining us.